One Small Step by Haldane B. Doyle Narrated by William Skye Doyle's new series of novellas, Her Vitreous Womb, is set to release in April 2023. They explore a distant post-industrial future where biological technology has transformed humanity. If you like the kind of stories on this channel, I recommend you do what I've already done and sign up for monthly updates about the new releases and more great short stories, all for free. Head over to haldanebdoyle.com, link on the screen and in the description. But for now, sit back, relax, and enjoy. Professor Leakey stared out the window of the rover, transfixed by the branching orange lichens, cushions of spiky moss, and mysterious pinprick tracks dotting the mud. Long hours since they arrived at the surface hadn't diminished her wonder at the diverse life forms in this strange and hostile environment. Before this mission, her fellow scientists only had fragments of surface life to study, whatever happened to Wash and Reach. Those specimens were highly degraded, leaving too much room for speculation. Yet now she was here, on the first exploratory mission, with a sheet of glass between her unblinking eyes and the sprawling ecosystem. She risked distracting Sergeant Finbold at the controls. You must be tired of me saying it, but it's remarkable any organisms can live up here. Harsh radiation, dehydration, the full force of gravity to contend with. It's hard to believe it might all be descended from corresponding organisms in the sea. Piffle, grumbled Finbold, trunk firmly gripping the steering lever. You spawnheads will dream up anything to spice up your next speaking tour. This mission is serious business. Once our technology improves, we can claim the landscape for ourselves. Think of the opportunities. No more making room for cephalopods and mantis shrimps. It was true most of the funding to construct the rover had come from the real estate industry, but the research institutions had been key to getting the rover to work. Just the biopolymers to make a strong enough lifeline cable was a minor miracle. A fresh pulse of oxygen-rich water flushed the cabin to power the peristaltic feet throbbing below. An electrified message pulsed down the communicator, so Leaky rested her trunk on the terminal to detect the signal over the background hum. Status report, Leaky. It was Admiral Houston. Returning to base, Admiral. Estimated arrival a little after sunset. Request permission to try the water lock for sample collection. Denied. I won't tolerate the risk. The mechanism worked fine in the lab. Don't question my authority. Return to base without delay. Professor Leaky floated to the front of the cramped rover and relayed the brief. From high above Fimbold's head, the larger forward window gave a clear view of the delicate track she had spotted on the journey out. One set of muddy pinpricks ran up and over the lifeline cable. Whatever mysterious creature made them had to be close. Shuffling to the side window, she looked out across the pads of lichen and spotted it. Shining black segments with glowing red legs, a little longer than her trunk. Most importantly, it was moving slower than the rover. Hard left, called Leaky. There's a land animal within reach. Please, Finbolt, you have to let me collect it. What? You have no idea if it's dangerous. And Admiral Houston said... We need results to excite the research community. Don't you want more technology to support colonization? Damn it, it's getting away. Finbold pulled back on the steering lever and stopped the vehicle without further acknowledgement. After pausing for a moment, he steered the lumbering machine up and over a bank of moss. Look at all those feet. Almost a hundred of them. I could name it Hectopeda. Why not exaggerate properly and go for Millipeda? Professor Leakey wished she could name the species Leakeyi to cement her reputation, but that would be embarrassingly egotistical. Look, Finbold, it curled up. Not like a polychaete worm at all. Easy to get in a sample bottle. Just a little closer. And stop. Good, I'm not getting closer to that drop-off. You know how unforgiving gravity is up here. And if it bites your trunk off, you'll get no sympathy from me. Through the side window, the spiralled landworm nestled on a cushion of moss on the edge of an eroded cliff. Leaky ran through the steps to operate the waterlock several times, just as the engineers had shown her, convincing herself the creature had to be a harmless herbivore. When the final seal released, the pressure in the cabin noticeably dropped. Leaky extended her trunk outside, pushing closer to the opening to block the water escaping, stretching a few more millimetres. The rim of her trunk slipped and slipped again on the waxy carapace of the creature. She was so close she could feel the electrical impulses rippling beneath its exoskeleton, but she couldn't get a grip. Pulling back a little to change her position, a torrent of water poured out from the opening. Below the waterlock, the stream was steadily eating away at the sandy bank. The rover tilted noticeably. That's it, exclaimed Fimbold. No more messing around. Seal that up so we can build pressure and get out of here. Leaky tightened her swim bladder and sank a little, then did as instructed. Except the mechanism wouldn't lock together as the engineers had shown her. 
In a panic, she wrenched the waterlock back and forth, but the seal wouldn't realign. Meanwhile, water continued to pour out, eating at the bank and tilting the rover even more. She was about to suggest jamming herself against the opening to seal it and limp home when the bank gave away entirely. The rover tumbled on its side several times, the gurgling water and rippling air bubbles swirling around them. It came to a stop, upside down, front window buried in the dirt. Finbold had sprained his trunk hanging onto the controls. Now we've done it. All this for a damn landworm, he grumbled. Leaky ignored him and activated the communicator. Houston, Admiral Houston, we seem to have a slight problem. But there was no response. Pressure is zero, reported Finbold. Lifeline probably snapped. The sun streaming through the side window reminded them of the inhospitable world between them and home. The searing radiation, unbreathable atmosphere, overpowering gravity. Finbold, the oxygen in here will only last an hour or so. Do you think they might send out the prototype rover to retrieve us? They would never reach us in time. This was my fault. I never should. Cut that out. It was my decision too. The two floated in silence a moment until Leaky remembered the step to seal the waterlock. Neither said anything for quite some time as they listened to the rover groan as it sank deeper into the sand. Finbold, do you really think we can live up here? Permanently? That it could ever be safe? Ha! You're the egghead. I thought your sort jumped at any excuse for more gizmos and tech. It's funny. The more you work with technology, the more you realise how unreliable it can be. As if to answer, the rover emitted a run of strangled gurgling, then, satisfied at its contribution, fell silent once more. Hey, Leaky, if we die up here, do you think they'll remember us as heroes or fools? Instead of answering, she swam upwards to the hatch in the floor and started activating the mechanism. With only one of us inside, it doubles the oxygen left. More time for a shot at rescue. And it was my fault. I wanted to see the land life up close. Now I get my wish. If only I could have shared my findings with my colleagues. She had hoped he would say something to comfort her, persuade her to risk staying but he merely watched with his unblinking eyes. If he survived, he would be the hero, and she would be the fool. If you make it home, Finbold, make sure they name that landworm after me. Before he could reply, with a flick of her tail, she propelled herself over the edge of the hatch and rolled down into the moss. She had trained for brief excursions out of water. Because of that, the tense film of moisture clinging to the slime on her eyes was not entirely unfamiliar. Her gills stung and her heart hungered for oxygen, but she convinced herself it would pass. She had even been trained to avoid looking directly into the unfiltered light of the sun, but she did look, just for a moment, at its unforgiving brilliance. After a moment, none of these notions could force their way to the front of her awareness. Instead, the peculiar prickly texture of the pads of moss against her trunk fascinated her. There was no way such an organism could be descended from the flimsy chlorified algae that struggled to secure territory along the coastlines. And that landworm, it was nothing like a sediment-burrowing polychaete. No living thing could change that much. Next, those evolutionists would propose that fish could grow legs and conquer the land without any technology, if only they had the patience to wait long enough. No, the land life must have originated somewhere else, somewhere deep inside the barren heart of the continent. Soon her people would perfect their rovers and land suits and go find them. She only wished she could have seen it for herself. As her vision dimmed and the sun stung her exposed flesh, Professor Leakey praised the unstoppable march of technology. Soon her people would tame this inhospitable world with their ingenuity. Soon the elephant fish would rise to greatness. If you enjoyed this story by Haldane B. Doyle, make sure to head to his website haldanebdoyle.com and sign up for updates and more short stories. And there's another Doyle short story on this channel already, The Fermi Orthodox, which you can see on screen now.